Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, welcome to the final day of Career Boot Camp 2024, where you will learn to um, evaluate and elevate your career to new heights. Please note that this session will be offered in English and French simultaneously. To view French sessions, uh, please return to the Zoom lobby and join the French session. As I stand in solidarity with my Indigenous brothers and sisters, I acknowledge that the land on which I'm situated is the traditional territory of the Wendat, Anishinaabeg, and Haudenosaunee peoples, and I encourage all of you to acknowledge the land you're on as well. Career Boot Camp is the largest conference in the GC, and the only goal is to support you in your career journey. As we move through today's session, please share your questions by using the Q&A button in the language of your choice, by clicking the thumbs up button. Also, please ensure as, as much as possible that your questions are related to the topic of today's discussion. If you're looking for answers on additional, um, on additional topics, you can find resources, including links to session recordings and podcasts on the FYN wiki page under resources. As with all FYN sessions, this session will be recorded, so you can go back to, um, to check out the recordings and the insights at a later date. In addition to the recordings on our YouTube channel, we're also offering another way to learn this year, a podcast series of the Career Bootcamp sessions. After CDC, the podcasts will be made available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. We would also like to note that the PowerPoint presentations for each session is included on our Wiki page so that you can feel free to follow along at your own rate and to improve your learning experience. Also, all the resource, resource, resources shared during this session will be added to our wiki page under resources. My name is Mackenzie Ricketts, and it is a pleasure to be moderating today's session. I am an acting senior project officer with Correctional Service Canada. Um, some of my layers include being a woman of Canadian Caribbean descent, and I have dark brown kinky hair, dark brown eyes, and I'm wearing a cream colored button down shirt and gold jewelry. So our learning objectives for today are, and I'll just go to that slide quickly, thank you. Our learning object objectives for today are understanding the roles of specialists and generalists, exploring the advantages of both types of professionals, and identifying personal fit and career strategies. Before we get started, we do have a couple of quick polling questions. Again, this is not a test and it is not mandatory, but we would definitely appreciate your participation. Our first question is, how much, how much do you already know about this topic? Number one, which do you think is more in demand in today's job market? A, specialists with deep exper uh, expertise in a specific field, journalists with a broad range of skills and adaptability, both are equally in demand, or lastly, not sure. Our second question or our second polling question is what do you value most in your career? Becoming an expert in a field, having a wide range of skills and being adaptable, balancing both the above, or lastly, I've never given it much consideration. I'll just give you a few moments to complete that poll question and then we'll share share the results. Okay, and our, our poll looks like the majority for question one said both are equally in demand. And for number two, the, the majority response was bal balancing both the above. Great, thank you very much for your participation. So let's, let's get started. Um, I would just like to take a moment to introduce our panelists. We are fortunate to have with us here today, Kevin Louis Nanga and Awo Nu. Kevin Louis Nanga is Deputy Director in Human Rights Division at Global Affairs Canada. He joined the federal government in November 2018 as a case management officer with the Canada Student Loans Program at Employment and Social Development Canada. Prior to join, joining the public service, Kevin worked as a flight attendant for two years with WestJet Airlines and had the opportunity to travel the world. 
Born to a Rwandan mother and Congolese father, he spent his youth in Canada, in Ottawa, in Zimbabwe. In his spare time, Kevin enjoys traveling, meeting new people, and dancing, Afrobeat, Soga, and hip hop. Welcome, Kevin. And Avo Nu. Avo Nu is a manager in the anti racism unit at the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Previous to this role, she was a manager in the Equity, Diversity and Inclusion team at Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada, and also served as a senior analyst at the Privy Council office, supporting the implementation of the call to action on anti-racism, equity and inclusion. Awo started her public service career with Employment and Social Development Canada before moving to Treasury Board Secretariat, where she spent nine years working on strategic policy, cabinet submissions, and union management engagement on employee wellness. Awo was also a senior analyst in the Respectful and Inclusive Workplaces branch within the Canada School of Public Service. Awo has an undergraduate degree in economics from the University of Ottawa and a master's in public administration from Carleton University. Outside of work, Awo is a mother of two and is passionate about volunteering in her local community. So with that, let's go ahead and get started and I will pass it on to our, our great speakers today. Thank you so much, Mackenzie, and welcome everyone. Uh, so just in terms of this slide, uh, really it's a comparison between specialized skills and transferable skills. So the more specialized skills are very specific uh, to your work and, and come with certain professions and certain fields that require designations of some sort, whereas transferable skills really determine your ability to fit into particular structures, apply your knowledge and skills, and ultimately succeed uh, in your career. So in, in terms of um, comparing the two, specialized would be very, very specific to the field that you're in, and you would have that deep knowledge uh, that, that would be considered relatively narrow compared to transferable skills, which are more broad and which continue to evolve and, and change uh, with your respective role and, and job. Now I'd like to invite my, my fellow um, co-panelist, Kevin, to discuss the next slide. Thanks so much, Owl, and uh, nice to nice to be here. Thank you so much to the Federal Youth Network for inviting us to speak. Um, I think maybe an important way to think about the difference between generalists and specialists is that when you're a generalist, I would encourage you to think about it horizontally, which means you have to know a little bit about a lot of things. So think about it as a horizontal line in terms of a generalist. And when we think about a specialist, think about it in a vertical line, which is you have a deep knowledge of a specific subject. So you're really um, you're really particular in, in your approach and your, your expertise is very specific. Um, we'll talk a bit later about what we personally prefer and what our experiences are. Um, but I could tell you, spoiler, that um, it's always nice to have a nice mixture and to have a hybrid approach. Um, so in the government of Canada, I think we're, we're very fortunate in that it's very easy to organize ourselves. Um, functional communities are organized based on classification for the most part. So for example, an IS or a communication specialist is someone who you know works in the field of communications and is therefore an expert. But it's important to recognize that even within these classifications, you have different sets of expertise, right? So an IS could be someone who is a spokesperson. So you work with the media and you make sure that the government of Canada has a certain image and is responding to you know, difficult questions in a certain way. So your expertise is dealing with the media, um, understanding who the stakeholders are, et cetera. Or you could be an IS who is a speech writer and therefore your expertise is very narrow in that you need to be an excellent writer and need to be able to take sort of small, um, not, not much information and repackage it into a speech for ministers, for deputy ministers, et cetera. So even within a classification, you'll notice that there's different kind of areas of specialty. So there's, I think it's an important way to kind of frame, frame that. And you'll notice that classifications also have uh, associations attached to them, um, right? And so, so you find a group or community. I, I would say, you know, my experience personally, I'm currently at Global Affairs Canada working as a deputy director responsible for, for human rights. I'll get into a bit more about my work and sort of, again, how, how it meshes specialization with being a generalist and how my previous experience has added to it. But I do think uh, we all belong to specific group and that we have associations and, and different groups even online that you can kind of connect with to learn more of. But um, ultimately, I think hybridity, hybridity is the best. Um, we'll talk about that more, but I think I'll pass it over back to Owl for the next slide. 
Thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, so this is very much about transferable skills. Uh, the way that I would think about these are those horizontal skills that are shared across uh, a number of different roles that you could play across the public service. So we do have 300 uh, plus thousand employees that are doing a variety of functional roles, as Kevin alluded to in terms of the previous slide. So you can have extremely technical roles uh, that we'll get into a little bit in terms of the scientific field, for instance, or you can have more broad policy development roles roles that entail any number of different skills. So these are the, the skills that we'd carry you through from, from different functional communities and different functional roles that you could play, whether you're uh, granting, you know, um, certain contribution agreements to develop workplace skills, for instance, in, uh, um, you know, Western provinces, or you are developing uh, artificial intelligence uh, and ethics-based uh, policies and practices, whether you're looking at telecommunications policies, so the transferable skills are really what bind all of those different roles together and what you would carry with you from one role to another. So they could include, as we see on the screen, communication skills, strategic thinking, I would add project management, I would add collaboration and communication, uh, and as well as uh, empathy and analytical skills. So being able to communicate, collaborate, being able to manage uh, projects and being able to work with folks within your organization, as well as external partners is, is core to, to any role that you would play within the public service. I would also add that the Canada School of Public Service does have a, a business line focused on transferable skills in which it's really about the portable skills that you have from one sector to another. So your public service career could have a tangent where you find yourself in a different sector, and these are the skills that you would bring with you and continue to sharpen and strengthen. And I'll turn it over to Kevin. Thanks, thanks, Owl. And I, I, I want to add something that's um, that I think everyone should maybe take away with you is, everyone needs to have, I guess you could say, your personalized bag of skills that you take with you everywhere that will make you succeed in either a specialist role or a generalist role. And my humble opinion is that you should have, I would say, three three skills that everyone sort of keeps with them. I think the first one, to kind of adapt anywhere, let it be specialist or generalist, is being able to write well in the government of Canada. In any job that you go to, you'll need to be someone who can write properly and well and be able to adapt to different audiences. So, so having strong writing skills will make sure you succeed basically in any generalist or, or specialist role. Um, I think the other one is being flexible and adaptable, just being someone who's able to respond to different needs that are unexpected quickly. The government of Canada, as all of us know, uh, you know, you get you get different different requests and different changes all the time. You know, there might be a change in uh, government, for example, or a change in political party that that is responsible for the government. So you need to be able to to be flexible and adaptable, and someone who does what is told, but is also able to add add some flavor. And then I would say the third scale that you should have probably is being a good public speaker, being comfortable speaking, briefing, because anywhere that you go, again, that's a skill that will be helpful. So. We'll talk a bit again about the benefits of being a specialist or generalist, but you should each have, I guess, a key core package that you take with you everywhere that you go. And my recommendation is that you at least think about some of the skills that you want to carry with you. And I would say those three that I named are, are really important. Um, with, with hybridity, why it's so important is because you'll notice that, as, as mentioned before, within, within any, any given classification, there's going to be multiple kinds of jobs, including some that are more specialist oriented and others that are more generalist oriented. You'll notice as well that as you progress in your career, so I'm currently a deputy director, which is, yeah, so I guess next step for me would be in the executive world. You notice that um, increasingly you have to be comfortable with being a generalist as you move up. Like you're, you're letting go of specialty and you're relying on a team and you're moving towards a generalist approach as you move up the ranks. So, um, you know, having expertise and being a specialist is always helpful and good, but you'll notice that as you move up, you need to start taking in some of the specific generalist ways of being and, and doing in order to, to progress in your career because you don't have the time to become a specialist or the, the person who is a, is a know-it-all of a specific of a specific subject. Um, so we'll jump into, I know folks have a lot of questions and you want to jump into things, so I think we could I'll pass it back to Mackenzie to uh, to help with the, the Q and A's, but we'll, we have a lot of info and insights that we're excited to share with you. Could I just say one thing, Kevin? You've inspired me to to say share one comment as you were um, describing um, what to carry with you and what's what's valued and important across public service. 
some of the best advice that I've received, and I'll just make it one comment and move on to McKinsey, is that it doesn't necessarily get easier as you progress in your career, but you get better at it. And I find that that better at it often means being able to deal with certain levels of ambiguity. Right. And and as you said, just kind of thinking on your feet, being adaptable, uh, knowing who does what, where, when you find yourself in a new organization. So that level dealing with a certain level of ambiguity and and knowing that as as time goes on, you'll get better at it, even if the space that you're in isn't always the easiest. But but you've uh, you've grown in that in that role and you become much better at it. So I'll stop it there. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, Just as a reminder, as we move into the. Q&A period of this session that you are able to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. And again, remember that um, you can vote for the questions that you like by using the thumbs up um, icon as well. So we'll we'll go with the questions that are most upvoted and, and then we'll try to get to the other questions. So the first question, I'll direct this to you, Kevin, is I'm concerned that if I embrace being a generalist, that I will be stuck in an endless cycle of short contract roles. Is this a valid concern or can generalists find indeterminate work too? Great question. Um, So, you know, I'm going to say that it's a valid concern, absolutely, um, but that you can absolutely find indeterminate work as a generalist. So in the government, the way I like to think of it is a specialist role would be, um, again, like perhaps a communications type job where you're very specific. Um, So that's like the kind of work that you do, but there's also the kind of job that you can have, right? So I would say there are probably two different streams in my mind. One is a more sort of corporate related role or a job that's corporate in nature, and you have to have that horizontal perspective. So for example, if you're someone who works in cabinet affairs, if you work in the office of a director general, of an assistant deputy minister, of a deputy minister, when you're in one of those corporate roles, by virtue, you have to be a bit more of a generalist, okay? Um, I would say that it's quite there's quite a need to be frank, um, for folks to to enter those kinds of jobs, A, because they're very difficult. You need to be, again, have a deep knowledge of many things, but the knowledge has to, sorry, have a shallow knowledge of many things. So it's it's a bit hard to manage in that way. Um, So there's definitely opportunities to get a lot of indeterminate jobs through this lens of being a generalist, someone who sits in an office, like an executive office of sorts. Um, and, And the good thing is once you do have one of those jobs, which, you know, people are often fear, it opens up doors because because you're a generalist that has a bit of knowledge in in so many areas, you then can jump into an area of specialty that you have a bit of knowledge into because you kind of have like a door open um, that lets you kind of jump in there. So I would say, and I, I'm, I'm telling you this coming from having worked in a minister's office. I was like the departmental liaison between the political staff and the department, which is a very, very difficult job. But I can tell you, there are a lot of indeterminate positions available in those roles because because it's 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 hard. And then you get set up for success because then you've networked with so many people in your department and you've opened so many doors that you then can jump into your next role, which is how I actually ended up working as a deputy director in the human rights division. I, it was one of my files that I covered in the minister's office. So I think generalists actually, from my personal recommendation is that it's kind of the best stepping stone into the government because then it lets you, it opens so many doors and gives you so many transferable skills that you then fall into a specialization. So you could definitely get a permanent job um, and actually lend to something that's that's fascinating through that, that approach. Um, Owl, any thoughts? Yes, I, I fully agree, and it's consistent with my experience. I, I started off as an economics student thinking, you know, I would work in labor economics. I was very much seized by uh, how best to ensure that our labor market really utilized the skills of internationally trained professionals. I had parents with degrees from all over the world who weren't uh, being uh, valued uh, appropriately in our labor market. So I was very much seized by labor economics, specializing in that. And uh, it wasn't until I did a co-op stint at HRSDC many years ago that I thought of public service and being a generalist as something that I could leverage because my economics degree was able to give me the analytical skills, but the tools that were given to me were so specific to being an economist for my career that I, I had to learn on the job, learn from others, and expose myself to, to other opportunities. And I, I found I've, I've just been so grateful. Some of the, the best jobs that I've had so far have been in areas that I never expected. I've never expected to work with 
union management uh, roles, never expected to work in a space um, related to uh, in the School of Government uh, for the Government of Canada. So really, it, as a generalist, I find it, it allows you to be flexible and adaptable, as Kevin said. And there are certain urgent, ambiguous requests that come in all of the time. And being able to have certain core skills that you can pull from and, and a high level awareness of certain issues that I, I think it prepares you really, really well. Uh, I'll just leave it on one note where some of the, the best opportunities that I have found was working in a strategic policy shop at, at the Treasury Board of Canada Secretariat. We covered a wide area uh, related to the Government of Canada's management agenda. So everything from open government to people management to financial management. And I'm not necessarily an expert in any of these areas, but I can write a note on it and I can speak to it in a presentation or for a few minutes. And those are the, the transferable, adaptable skills that you need uh, to be able to, to pull from what you have. And if you do need that deep technical knowledge, you have to know who to go to for that. So if we needed pensions advice, a benefit specialist, what have you, we can pull that knowledge in, but you have to stitch it together and provide that greater view of how does it align with the priorities of the day? What does it mean for the audience that you're speaking to, whether it's your senior leadership, community engagement, bargaining agents? So how do you pivot and leverage uh, the best of the information that you have at the time of writing? That's the other piece. You're not going to have all of the elements that you need to proceed with, with the uh, the task at hand. It's the best information available at that particular time. No, thank you. Thank you for that response, oh, well, and, and Kevin. And I think this next question kind of ties well into what you both touched on and, and spoke about when you noted the um, putting together that key core package of what you'll need in your career. So the question is, what key skills support transitions between specialist and generalist roles? And I think you've kind of touched on that a bit, but if you could elaborate a little more on that question, we'll start with um, you all and then Kevin, if you'd like to add anything to that. Thank you, Mackenzie. That's a really great question. I found for me, it's come down to, to four uh, key skills. So communication is on top of the list and, and it's key to any position that you'll hold or any role that you'll take on. Being able to convey your ideas to a team or an audience that may not be familiar with your role, your mandate, your project, and, and being mindful of how best to, to craft certain messaging. And of course, this may be done in a team setting as well. How best to craft certain messaging for an audience that may agree with the area uh, that you're in and the work that you're doing, or that may be skeptical of it. And I absolutely find that in the space of uh, transformative culture change uh, with regards to anti-racism and, and equity, diversity, and inclusion, you do find that you have a coalition of the willing folks who are allies and advocates, you have folks who may be skeptical, and then a vast array in the middle of folks who may not be sure how best to engage or be involved. And you have to be able to tailor your messaging and your approach to that audience. A second uh, skill would be collaboration. It's fundamental to any transition. Identify who's doing what, determine your role, find ways to work together and to contribute. I've said it in a meeting earlier this morning and I'll always say it, it takes community to do the work that we do in the public service. We, we are serving the public and we need different skills and different experiences, both lived and professional in order to make that happen and to ensure that we're delivering the best service to Canadians and providing the best advice to our leadership. Project management is another skill. It's um, You will always need to manage a project of some kind, be it short term or long term, be it something that's, that's a bit more direct and, and simple or something more horizontal that involves different uh, teams and units within your organization or even different departments. So being able to have those project management or organizational skills is key. And then finally, analytical skills, being able to see the big picture and being able to make different linkages across the system and applying a horizontal lens to your work so that it resonates in terms of the advice that you're providing. Oh, thank you so much. I love the, the tangible skills that you can take and apply to, to your role. Kevin, I'll ask if there is anything that you'd like to add to this. I think, yeah, I will really hit the nail on the head. Um, I'll share maybe a personal experience just to kind of help people understand um, where I'm at and and the benefits sort of, again, the interconnection between the two and why they're so important. So, so as I mentioned, I used to work in the departmental liaison unit at Global Affairs. So in that job, you're stuck in the middle between the bureaucracy. So, you know, you're talking to ADMs and DGs every day and with the political exempt staff that work for the minister in question. So I was like in between and my job is to communicate between both and to make sure that there it's smooth and there are no issues, which as you can imagine was very, very difficult and 
my days were filled with drama and I definitely made some enemies, but it was completely worth it because when I finished that job, um, one of the dire directors that I worked for or worked with on certain files, on the human rights files, told me about an opportunity on his team. And he said, you know, I think you'd be a really good match. Now, the human rights that I work on specifically is related to anti-Semitism and Holocaust preservation. So I work for the Special Envoy, Canada's Special Envoy for Holocaust Remembrance and uh, Combating Anti-Semitism. And, you know, I thought this was early September. So I thought to myself, oh, I'm finally going to get a break after working so hard in the minister's office. And then the war broke out. So you can imagine uh, it's been very busy, very, very chaotic, and just a difficult job. Um, so, so, so now I have this very interesting job where I, I'm the deputy director for Canada's Special Envoy on Combating Antisemitism and their international aspects. And what that means is really having to, to marry both the, the generalist and the specialist approach. Why? I need to know and understand what it means to be an expert on anti-Semitism and on hate speech in general in Canada. That's the sort of specific. And then the, the general is I need to understand how the government system works, everything. I need to understand uh, who needs to be briefed on certain points, who needs to be looped in when we're doing a media request with the media, who needs to, I need to understand the system in place as a, as a generalist and understand a little bit about everything so that I'm making sure that nothing is falling through the cracks. So back to the three kind of areas that I was talking about, the kind of personal toolkit that you have that you want to make sure, doesn't matter if you're a generalist or a specialist, uh, writing well. Why I say that's important is because in my job now, I have to write speeches. So if you know your, your boss will come to you and say, I need this speech written for me for International Holocaust Remembrance Day. So you need to write it really quickly. So again, a skill set that wherever I go is helpful. Um, adaptability, well, a war broke out when I started this job. And, you know, I'm now thinking I'm going to get a really chill, relaxed job, but instead I'm working overtime all the time and I'm traveling with my boss across the country and internationally. And so you have to be adaptable and ready to, to, to engage in whatever scene comes your way. So that's, that's why it's so, so, so important. And then public speaking, well, um, you need to brief your boss and your bosses eventually and tell them what's going on. They're, they'll have questions about, um, okay, so I need to, I need, I'm going to meet with, uh, I'm going to meet with my counterpart in the U.S. So what am I supposed to bring up? So you need to be the person that understands how to brief effectively, how to take three, four minutes of your boss's time and tell them what they need to know. And that cuts across whether you're a generalist or a specialist. So again, figure out what your personal toolkit is, what your personal brand is, and make sure that you have that when you go into whatever position. And I would say one last thing, you need to work on having a brand and a personality that's that's likable, basically. Um, a lot of people focus and come to these chats to learn about how do I advance my career and how do I, how do I, you know, meet people and network. Well, I think at the forefront of all of it is: Are you someone that's easy to work with, and are you someone that is pleasant, understandable, you know, chill, relaxed? Is that the personality that you're that you're giving off? Are you easy to? Are you easy? Do you not bring any problems, essentially? So that would say that's probably at the top, even before choosing between generalist and specialist. Are you easy to work with? And do you bring value just in terms of being kind of a, a, a likable or friendly person? Because that will go a very, very, very long way, no matter which direction you choose. Great. Thank you for that, Kevin. Absolutely. And, and one thing to add, that this takes time. <laughs> this is not something that you just can do overnight or within a week. It takes intentional time to build that, um, that package in that brand. And segueing into our next question, I think that kind of touches on that brand that you're creating for yourself um, when you're pitching yourself or presenting yourself. So the question is, um, which has quite, quite a few upvotes, interested in tips for how to market yourself, resume, cold call, emails, et cetera, when you've um, had a career as a generalist, I'm finding it hard to write my elevator pitch for myself. So, you know, why don't we start off with a uh, well, uh, why don't you go ahead and, and discuss that? And then Kevin, if you have anything to add, we'll, we'll segue back to you. Sure, I'll, I'll maybe take a page off of Kevin's book and just make it a little bit of a story and then get to the, the point afterwards. I, I struggled with that. I struggled with uh, personally just uh, speaking to my my brand, how I market myself. And, and to me, it's all about my, my culture and how I was raised, where we talked about the unit. You talked about the family. You talked about the community. You didn't necessarily talk about yourself because it would be 
quote unquote boastful or what have you, but you're you're in an area now where you're in a Canadian job market, right? And you need to be able to demonstrate your value and your contribution. So I I had a mentor who taught me not to speak about what we did and what I did, rather what I did. And so as a generalist, that's a challenge, but it's incredibly important to think about in this project that you're doing, what is your contribution? What are you bringing to the table? Are you the writer that's drafting? So I, I used to plan um, a lot of missions abroad for the Secretary of the Treasury Board. Uh, and as part of that, we would do you know all kinds of briefing packages and it included everything from the itinerary to briefing notes to speaking points, but it was, it was a team effort. And so I had to be very specific about my value added to say, I had developed these particular notes, I had provided this advice. And I would start it off by just writing it out write out exactly what you've done in each of the key projects that you consider to be really symbolic of the skills that you have, right? Do you have great project management skills? Do you have great data uh, anal analysis skills? Do you have uh, wonderful communication skills in terms of being able to tell a convincing story um, through a presentation and being able to, to relay that, right? So really hone in on how you've contributed to uh, to a particular project that was key to your unit, your team, or your organization, tying it right back again to the priorities of, of that department. So that's a, a, a bit of your your value, and you can take that with you. And in, in terms of that transition question to your new role, right? So when I'm, for example, new to the RCMP, three months in, and so coming in, uh, there's not always a runway to to onboard, and you kind of jump right in. But I had to think about that initial tasking of well, what can I bring to the table? I have experience in, in anti-racism and EDI and in some central agency experience. Can I jump in and tie it to that bigger picture of what I know my experience to be? And other folks can step in and provide that departmental lens that I will you know, get used to as time goes on, but I can still contribute in some way because you're not necessarily unless you're entirely new to the public service, you're coming in with a certain perspective, even if you're new to the public service, you've worked in the private sector, the not for profit, etc, you're bringing something to the table that's of value, just sit down and kind of think about how you've contributed how you would uh, market yourself and what your your skills are that, uh, that you would bring whether it's communicating, writing, collaborating, project management, certain uh, technical skills around data, uh, or technology. I'll stop there. Thanks. Those are and great points. Add? Yeah, okay. I'm I'm ready to jump in. Those are those are really great points. Um, I will. Um, the question that you posed, I was so important, is the what do I bring? What do I bring? Um, and as a generalist, I would say that there are three things that you should really focus on selling when you're talking to people. The first thing is you need to be able to sell your capacity to connect the dots. When you're a generalist and you you're sitting on the horizon, you're someone who by virtue of your work has to connect the dots quickly and make linkages like that is part of a generalist role is you need to be able to make these links and connect them and i think that's a that's something that you're able to bring to someone when you're trying to advertise yourself as something that's a lot of value added because uh as we know a lot of the government works in silos right and so being able to advertise yourself as someone who can connect the dots really makes you stand out and attractive to employers um a generalist also by virtue has to be a very good communicator because you need to be able to, again, have that, that horizontal perspective and thus communicate clearly so that, again, silos are being broken down. So emphasize your communication skills. And again, that, I think that's something that employers will really, really admire. And then maybe the last thing that I would say is as a, horizontal, or as a, as a generalist, you have to have good judgment because you need to know, okay, I have, I have 10 different things that I know sort of like surface level, when do I need to dive into a certain aspect of, of my files, right? You need to have that awareness and that's something that you can market yourself to and people will, will, will really resonate with. I will also say that it's important to choose a department, right? Because specific departments have different types of polls and appeals based on whether you're a specialist or a generalist. So for example, the Canadian Radio and Television Commission, the CRTC is really filled with specialists. You have to be a specialist in like telecommunications policy to work there, or that's kind of what you develop, right? Whereas if you go to the Privy Council office, the PCO, that you have to be, you have to be really a horizontal sort of general journalist approach to work there. So think about different departments, what your skills are, and know that some of them will really kind of welcome you a bit more openly because of that skill set um, and that that might be sort of something to consider when you're when you're looking for opportunities. 
if I can add one more point, and I'm really sorry, Mackenzie, I think I'm just taking over your timing today. Not a problem. I'll just add one more point, something that I find really, really helpful to me when I enter a new organization. The RCMP is my sixth organization in the last seven, 17 years within the federal public service, is that I, I try to find the time to get to know my audience. And I start off with my colleagues, but I also include my senior leadership. So if there's a recording of a town hall that your senior leadership has attended, and they were able to describe the vision that they see for the organization, the priorities that they see, get to know the voice and the terminology and the manner of speaking of your leaders. So because you will eventually as a generalist be developing products for them. So it's important to, to get a sense of their voices and of where they're coming from. Thank you both for those responses. Honestly, there's so much information shared that is just um, so applicable uh, that I'm taking my own notes as well. One of the one of the questions I think has been answered, but I'll just pose it just in case you'd like to add anything to that, which is, are there specific tips or approaches you recommend for personal branding, whether as a specialist or generalist? And I know you've spoken about this a bit, but just adding in that specialist piece, I think some more information could be shared on that. Should I tackle that one? Go ahead, Kevin, I can follow you after. Okay, so yeah, we talked a lot about personal branding as a generalist, um, as a specialist. So I think the kind of biggest element that you can bring forward when you're a specialist or something that really makes you stand out is the fact that you are an expert and in expertise, it means that you are someone that can research well, right? To be to be a specialist, you're someone that has to have a deep knowledge. So you, you're, you're, you're able to research well, you're good with information and knowledge management um, and and you're you you can be in many ways you have to be kind of independent and the per, the go to person and be okay with that. So so I think focusing on some of those elements of um, of of being a specialist and being sort of like the go to person and being okay with being the go to person can really help you in terms of personal branding. Um, I think as well though on top of that you have to again do the reflection to think about what exactly is it that what is my special toolkit. Right, because on top of those those elements around specialization, you need to have a personal toolkit that is something that you could sell, and you have to also work towards the bias that people have at times around specialists being people who work in silos. So think about how is it that as a specialist, I'm someone who brings value by consulting, by thinking outside of the box, by breaking down silos. Like think about any biases that people might have of specialists and how you combat those. And I think that'll make you someone that's brandable in a way that people will respect and admire. Um, go ahead, Owl. Thank you so much, Kevin. So I, I would just really add to your great points there that uh, it's important to be pragmatic and not a purist. When I was looking into, into the experiences of others in terms of specialist versus generalist, it's very, very much about that pragmatism. We're working in a very complex, interconnected environment that's been made has been made even more complex uh, as a result of the pandemic. So just being very pragmatic in terms of the advice that you provide, uh, essentially ensuring that there's a foundational set of, of tools, as Kevin said, that you're using, right? You're tying it to the priorities of the government here. You're, you're using certain terminology that's specific and, and relevant to that particular department. So you have a, a high level understanding of their, of their mandate. And what you're also doing, I think at the same time is thinking about ways that you don't necessarily spread yourself too thin. So you can absolutely brand yourself and bring your value to the table and speak to how you can contribute. But learning to also not spread yourself too thin is something that I think is, is really important that I, I take with me about, you know, fill your own cup, ensure that you're you're taking care of your mental, physical, and, and emotional well-being. Don't try to do it all yourself. Generalists don't do it all themselves, but they know who to go to in order to get certain things done. And that's where your value comes in, knowing who does what, where, and how it can contribute to the work that you're doing. So this is why you have a team, colleagues, delegate, determine whether where you can add value and where it makes sense for others to take things on. And again, uh, another great advice that I've received is separate the urgent from the important. There could be time sensitive tasks that may be transactional and are fairly low impact, low risk. And for those you can delegate, I would say. And however, if there are other tasks that are more impact for your work, your organization, the communities you serve that have more, that have greater value, that could be more high impact, high value, prioritize these and spend time there. So no one expects you to do it all. 
be uh, very specific in terms of the what you bring to the table and recognize where partnering with others makes the most sense, where you might have to have that, you know, I'm, I'm kind of building a, a briefing note or what have you in my mind, where you have that high level front end that links to the priorities of the day, the priorities of the organization. And then you may need to hone in on a specific topic if there's a specific item on the agenda. And that's where you can bring in the technical knowledge and you can have the best of both worlds in that uh, in terms of that advice. Thank you so much for that, Ewell. Kevin, did you have anything else for that particular question? I think we're good for that question. Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, I will direct this next one to you then. Um, when in a specialist role, what would be the steps to follow to get a more general role without taking a demotion? Oh, good question. Um, okay. So I would say there are two, two aspects to that based on my experience. The first one is... Um, once you're a specialist and you feel like you've kind of maxed out your capacity or you feel like you've really, there's nowhere left for you to go, um, I think that's actually the perfect time to jump into a role in an executive office. Now hear me out. I know a lot of people are really scared to go work, say for a DG or an ADM or um, a deputy minister. But once you're a specialist and you have the expertise on, on you know, say drafting or you have the policy expertise and you've had to draft, I don't know, a few memorandums to cabinet, a few TV subs, you've done sort of like the whole package that a, a specialist does, for for example. I think the the way to go without losing or to, to not get a demotion is to actually jump into an ex a role in an executive office that's a bit more fast paced, but by virtue more generalist. So I would say um, probably flag flag it to your management at some point that you know you feel like you're really prepared and be interested in in, a, in a, an opportunity in an executive office. They're always looking for people to take those jobs on, um, and I think that's actually a great way to get a promotion and to expand yourself from a specialist who is also someone who has experience as a generalist. The second thing I would say is um, a lot of people I find don't really take advantage of the jobs.gc.ca website and don't actually apply to as many competitions and processes as they should, especially if you have access to the internal um, the internal sites and, and the jobs that are only open to the, the Government of Canada employees. I think applying to pools is really a golden ticket to then decide whether you want to go into a generalist or specialist role. You kind of get placed into a pool and then managers come to you and say, here's a job that, that we have to offer. Or you actually have the power then to say, all right, manager X, I'm in an EC6 pool and I'm looking for a role that is more um, generalist in nature. What do you have? So I would say uh, it's important to keep on doing processes and to think proactively, like think for a year and a half or two years later, right? If you think like right now you're starting to, to, to get as much as you can as a specialist, and I would say apply for processes now so that you could leave in the next, I don't know, a year because you know how long the processes take, right? So just forward plan, uh, make it, make use of being in pools and advertising yourself. Um, and, and also if you can find an opportunity in an executive office, absolutely 100% do it because it opens so many doors and is, is totally worth it. Thank you, Kevin. Great advice. Um, oh, well, I'll direct this next question to you since we have about 10 minutes left in our Q&A. Um, what are some practical steps I can take to gain more expertise in a specific area if I want to become a specialist? Do I need to go back to school or are there other ways to develop these skills? Uh, absolutely. So I think it, it would depend. Uh, there's some... Um, specializations that require a designation of some kind or certification and for those you would need to take some type of training uh, depending upon the nature of the training there could be training available by the school of government through the Canada School of Public Service I know they do offer a ton of training in particular internal services in terms of human resources management financial uh, management procurement uh, there could be security as well so you can take those courses if that meets the requirements of the designation and in some instances you may have to also uh, go to an external uh, school, post-secondary institution, and the like, and then participate in, in that in that training uh, as well. What you can also do, depending on the role, is that you can build it into your performance management agreement. Really have that open conversation with your leadership so that it becomes part of your learning and development. 
And you can identify where you can do in-class learning or on-the-job learning. I've always found it useful to uh, do uh, on-the-job learning where you can, you know, do an assignment or a stretch opportunity or a micro mission uh, within another area. So I know, for example, I, I, there were years ago that I was really interested in program evaluation. I had the good fortune of having my management agree to, to give me once a week a micro mission with the corporate evaluation team. So I was able to, to help develop a logic model, help assess uh, and evaluate a certain program. And that was the, the practical experience that I needed. But four days out of the week, I was doing my, my day job and my nine to five job. But one day out of the week, I was able to learn and really get that hands-on experience. And that, that was wonderful. And I know in terms of that program evaluation role, if I continue with that example, you can continue with it and, can, and get a designation of, of some kind, but I wanted that practical experience. So on the, there's a balance to be had depending upon the, the nature of of what you're wanting to learn, the, the skills and the knowledge and the the academic training you already bring to the the table, and how you can leverage that to, to move forward. I know that was helpful for me in terms of having an undergraduate degree in economics and moving towards uh, a public policy and administration grad degree. There were some transferable courses that uh, that I could take, and then I could continue the journey from there. And also, don't underestimate job shadowing. I've job shadowed a few executives myself. I've learned a lot from them, just spending a day with them and seeing how they navigate certain meetings developing those really core and important softer skills, we call them, in terms of dealing with others, communicating, uh, thinking on the spot, and being able to engage. So just as a follow-up to that initial question, there's a, a question here that says, how can I ensure I'm not just spreading myself too thin and actually becoming valuable as a journalist, but I'll also I'll add as a journalist, generalist and specialist. And I think that kind of plays into what you were saying with job shadowing, doing the extra little bit. So how do you not spread yourself too thin? And I'll first have you uh, will answer this and then Kevin will we'll get your perspective. Uh, absolutely. I think I'd started to speak to it a little bit more earlier, but it was really the best advice that I'd received is that you have to outlast your, your work. So as important, urgent and valuable as your work is, it cannot be what depletes you. So you have to find opportunities to really fill your cup and, and take care of your mental, physical and emotional health. And for me, that means spending time with my family, uh, volunteering in my community, uh, really being with those that I love and giving back where I can and having that time to check in and, and really, whether that's a mental health day, a volunteer day, a do nothing day, because rest is resistance. You have to tell yourself that rest is resistance, especially if you're in that space of culture change, if you're in that space of, of doing um, EDI and anti-racism work, and ask yourself, what does peace look like for you? What does calm and joy look like for you? And take that time. Also, don't try to do it all by yourself. As I've said before, you have a team, you're part of a unit, uh, delegate and see where you can work with others and, and separate the urgent from the important in terms of prioritizing and really do that check in. I know particularly as you're transitioning roles, as you may be new to an organization, there's this urgent need to just demonstrate your value right away and to jump in. And that may not always be the best course of action. It may be better to just take a step back take it all in and give yourself that runway to uh, to decide how best to, to add value where you can. But I think having that check-in with yourself is really important so that you can sustain your work, sustain the momentum. Uh, you're, you're in this for the long term, right? Uh, and we often, our leadership, we often hear from them that we are, the people management and the, the people doing the work are their greatest assets and we have to manage these assets for the long term. You know, I will. You said all the things that that really should happen, right? Self care, like awareness, knowledge. I'd probably say those are my weak points, quite frankly. And I'd probably say many people at Global Affairs would agree, where we tend to work a bit too much. Um, but so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that you're absolutely right, and that those are the most probably most important things, if anything, to take away. Um, I will say. In government, I think the most important person is your manager. And so I'm, so if you want to think about how to bring value as a generalist, think about um, think about do is I, am I indispensable to my manager and am I the kind of person who has the can, 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 can my manager count on me and basically come to me if there's anything that they need? So as a generalist, what does that mean? It means you have line of sight on everything so that when your manager has a question, you say, here you go, here's what's going on. And you, you're proactive in many ways. That's, that's how you bring value, I would say, as um, 
as a generalist. Now, the flip side is, I think oftentimes you can fall into situations where you work way too much, <clears throat> don't rest as much, <clears throat> and don't have the healthiest habits. So not, not the proudest. Um, so I'd say probably in an ideal world, you'd want to find a balance where you're almost indispensable to your manager, but find the time craft yourself to say, actually, I'm going to take this day off. Saturday, I'm not reachable. Just having those, those clear boundaries. Um, I think that balance is probably the best. The best, And that, I guess that goes back to that point on the slide, which is hybridity, right? And hybridity goes beyond generalist and specialist. That also means like work-life balance, but also being kind of key and indispensable to the people that you work for. Cameron, I just want to touch on that, that uh, being indispensable piece. Would you say that applies to a specialist as well? Yes, I think it does. And quite quite frankly, I think it's actually a bit a bit easier to be indispensable as a specialist because you just need to know your subject matter deeply and, and very, very well, right? You have one area that you need to know super, super well. So I think that's how you bring bring value. Like your manager can take you to with them to a meeting and you have the deep knowledge that they can turn to you and say, on this point, can you please explain? And you're you're good. Um so yes, I think I think it's is as important. I, th I would say there are, there are a few more challenges to being indispensable as a generalist because, again, like you have to have a horizontal approach and you need to know when to, to dig in more about certain things. And you could get caught off guard many times, right? Because your manager will ask you, okay, well, what about this, which you have this much awareness of, but the manager wants this much of it. So I think there are a bit more challenges to being quote unquote indispensable as a generalist than as a specialist, but that you could definitely do it on in, in both realms. And that's it's equally important in both. Great, thank you for that. Um, being cognizant of our time, I think we'll probably have time right now for one to two more questions. I'll open this to both you, Kevin, and Awo. Um, for those who wish to have a steady and gradual career progression, for example, not stuck in an entry-level role for eight to 10 years uh, because of zero job openings, learning opportunities, or mobility within their organization, should you consider specialist roles instead of generalist ones? I, I can jump in. Uh, I don't know that there's one answer to that, but I will say if we look at our current executives, because I would consider them to, to be a symbol of success in terms of uh, navigating their careers that way. Currently in the public service, they include both generalists and specialists, but I find that there's a pattern of experiences uh, in the public service that are valued and rewarded, and these are more generalists. You have a deep knowledge of how government works, but you also have horizontal knowledge of internal services like human resources, financial management, security, and you have practical experience in certain processes like policy development and intergovernmental relations and even dealing with international jurisdictions. So I find if we were to look at executives in terms of where certain experiences that the system within the public service is rewarding and, and elevating, I would say it's it's more of the, the general skills. Uh, and in terms of being uh, being stuck, I've, I've definitely experienced that too, where you're stuck in a certain role, even with increasing responsibility, you're stuck in the same occupational group and level. There are certain um, opportunities that I've found that could be a lateral move. Let's say you do an assignment in a certain department on a certain project that allows you to showcase your skills. So uh, as unfortunate as it was, in terms of COVID, I saw some of my colleagues take on those horizontal assignments based on an urgent priority to help with the COVID task force, right? And that would, that gave them a wealth of experience that they wouldn't necessarily have, have had in their, their substantive role. And that, again, opened up their networks, opened up their experiences, and allowed them to be able to, to use that uh, those opportunities to, to seek advancement. So really thinking about lateral moves, it doesn't necessarily always have to be a straight promotion. Is there an assignment? that you could do somewhere that could help you um, obtain that uh, that experience that you need for promotion. Uh, have a mentor. Have a mentor and have a conversation. You're not, uh, my father used to always say, you're not going to live long enough to experience it all. So you need people who, wise people who are advising you who've been in it longer than you have. Seek out that mentorship. Get get some advice around how best to position yourself uh, for, for those opportunities that exist. Seek out developmental opportunities in your organization, whether it's the economist training program, the, the, the financial officer program, or the policy development programs. There are some developmental programs that can help you grow in your role as time goes on and really hone in on those competencies and the, the different um, expected 
uh, demonstrations of each competency as you go on. So there are opportunities to grow as you're continuing to seek your promotional opportunities. Great, thank you so much, Joel. Kevin, is there anything that you'd like to add? I just, I just want to say, um, always have bargaining chips in your pocket in the in the federal government. And I say this as someone who, I, if I showed you my jobs.gc.ca website, I've applied in the past four, five years that I've been in government, I must have applied to upwards of 60 jobs. Um, and the reason why I tell you this is because having the capacity to tell someone, a manager or someone else that you're in a pool and that there are opportunities coming your way really helps you then negotiate a little bit more for yourself and see about opportunities. So if there's one piece of advice that I also want, want to leave folks with is always have bargaining chips. And that is usually in the federal government in the form of being in a pool and being able to tell someone that you have opportunities because you're in this pool so that they know the value that you add. Um, if that's not possible, because I think the example that was asked that 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 was given there says that there are no job op job openings. I go back to the point around making yourself indispensable to your management so that they literally cannot function without you. So that then you have a bit more power to bargain effectively and to say, uh, okay, so I've given three, four years of my time. I've really been helpful. Um, it's time, I think, for me to move on and move forward. And because you're indispensable and they really can't say no to you, then they're in a, you're in a position where you have a bit more power. So if the pools aren't available, I would say make yourself absolutely indispensable in your work so that um, people know that like they have the option of helping you move on and progress in your career, or you leave and they are unfortunately left in a bit of a scramble. So not, you know, just, just some, some tips for me, but um, yeah, I, that's helped me a lot to get to where I am today um, in my career. Great. Thank you both very much. Strategic advice, strategic thinking. That's what I took from, from your responses. Um, but honestly, you have both been just such a wealth of knowledge today. And I know I personally have learned a lot and will definitely take some of these tips and apply them to my, my career and uh, go back and look at the recording uh, on that will be posted to YouTube um, if I have any more questions about this topic. If anyone, if you would like to know more about any of these topics, please check out the CBC 2024 Wiki resource page. Um, we'll just go back to our objective slide and we'll just do a quick recap of that. Um, again, our, our objectives for today were understanding the roles of specialists and generalists, exploring the advantages of both types of professionals, and lastly, identifying personal fit and career strategies, which I think our, our speakers definitely hit home. So thank you both very much for that. Um, we have one final polling question. The result from the poll will not be shared, but we do appreciate your participation with this. Was this session a good use of your time? Yes, no, or I don't know. And with that, I just want to say thank you for joining us today. A huge thank you to our amazing panelists for their thoughtful answers and for bringing Career Boot Camp to a close on such a high note. Uh, again, don't forget that there is one final chance to drop into the kiosk and speak to members of the GC communities from 3.30 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. ET, how to navigate the expo floor and kiosk booths. You just go to the expo tab in the, in the lobby menu. You have you'll enter the expo floor and you can move your avatar to enter the booths inside. The link also to all of the sessions as well as the networking events can be found on the Zoom events main page. Resources again will be available on the wiki page and the recording of this event will be available on our, our YouTube channel. Thank you again to our panelists and thank you for uh, to the Federal Youth Network for putting together such a great conference once again. Mm -hmm.